Our scripture lesson today is from Luke chapter 9, verses 28 through 36. Hear the word of God. Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. And then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent, and in those days told no one any of the things they had seen. May God bless the reading of this sacred word. One of my very favorite images of my son Adam, when he was just a little guy, maybe two or three years old, uh, came with his desire to have my full attention. He would come over and he would call out, Dad! And if my response was not immediate and my attention was not directed to him exclusively, he would come over and he would take his hand and he'd place it on my left cheek and then he'd take his other hand and place it on my right cheek and he would turn my head and point it down so that our foreheads touched face to face, nose to nose, eyes to eyes. And it was just us. There's nothing else. And that moment held everything. It was more than just father and son connecting. It was something so much bigger than just us. There, were, there was more going on than what physical eyes can see or understand. We entered a mystery that can neither be defined nor discussed, only experienced and enjoyed. I so miss those very special moments of connection with my son. They were moments of absolute joy. There are moments like that in everyday life. Lovers gazing at each other see more than just another person. They've been brought face to face with the divine mystery of love. Think about the day you first saw your child or your grandchild. You were seeing more than a crying infant. You were face to face with the mystery of life, the mystery of the future. Look at a little child who squeals with delight and quivers with excitement at a new discovery. <clears throat> it is more than excitement. That child has come face to face with the mystery of knowledge the mystery of deep joy that that brings. And recall a time that you made a confession, formal or informal, and experienced the forgiveness of God or another person. as much more than words, past behavior, and the memory of estrangement. You came face to face with the mystery of grace in the middle of brokenness. I remember a number of times being in the hospital room, waiting with loved ones as they watched their beloved take their final breath and be raised up and carried into new life. I have had that gift of spending more than one night face to face with the mystery of death. Friends, these are moments of transfiguration. Each one of them is distinct, unique, unrepeatable, exquisite, and yet they are all somehow the same. Each one is so transparent, so real, that they glow with the light of God's presence. They are moments of pure grace, 
We cannot make them happen. We can only be there when they do. And in that moment, everything seems to fall away. There are no distractions. It is a moment of complete presence, attention, and perfect union. It is a moment when we come face to face with another person, with ourselves, or with God. In that moment, we could truthfully say, I only have eyes for you. There's nothing else to be seen. That moment, the whole of life and earth is in it. Nothing else matters, not because they are excluded or unimportant, but because everything belongs. Everything is included in that moment. Nothing has been lost or left out. It is a moment of union with God, another person, oneself. We've experienced the uh, union of heaven and earth, divinity and humanity, spirit and matter, time and eternity. This is what happened to Peter, James, and John on the mountaintop in today's gospel reading, how they needed to be up on that mountain together. In the verses just prior to our text, Jesus had shared with them what was to come. He said, the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. Oh, how they needed loving hands, taking their attention away from their grief and disbelief to look into the eyes of God alone. That's what happened for these disciples, shocked and confused and grieving. This was not what they thought would happen the day they dropped everything in order to follow Jesus, not death. And thus when Jesus called his inner circle, Peter, James, and John, to go with him to the mountain, they were ready to go. They needed to go. They needed to be up in the mountain air where their minds would be cleared and sense could be made from the devastating words that Jesus had shared with them. The disciples could not have prepared themselves, though, for what took place on that mountaintop. They saw a change come over Jesus. The scripture says, and while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became dazzling white. They were shocked. They were lifted out of their worry and confusion and, for, and fear for a moment and filled with the wondrous, loving light of God's eyes shining through Jesus. As if this was not enough, Elijah and Moses appear talking to Jesus. The first, the prophet of their faith, and the, and the second, the one who brought them the law of God. It was not expected, it was not planned, it happened in a moment of grace, as all such times happen. Oh, there are times when God comes suddenly bursting into our lives, transforming our thoughts and behaviors, our dreams, our hopes. The confused and saddened disciples were given a glimpse of the dazzling future to come, a gift of God. Heaven and earth came together in that moment, time and eternity united as one, God bursting into life. That's what happened to Peter, James, and John on the mountain. This was as much their transfiguration as it was of Jesus. They didn't just see the light. They became the light, humanity, illumined with and by divinity. Jesus did not become something he was not before uh, that night on the mountain. Jesus was always filled with the glory of God radiating the divine light. De Jesus did not change and become something new, but the disciples did. Their sight was healed, their vision corrected, their blindness removed, and they saw the world transfigured, capable of revealing the beauty and the wonder of God's holiness. They experienced all of life and creation as sacramental, as a holy experience. They saw and experienced life in the world as God sees and intends it to be for all of us. Every time we experience a transfiguring moment, our vision is healed and we see things in a new and a different way. We're brought face to face, eye to eye, nose to nose with Jesus. 
He is what we see. The light in his eye, the brightness of his love, the peace of his presence, we see suddenly with God's eyes. Transfiguration is not so much about what we see, but how we see. It's the difference between seeing with physical eyes and seeing with transfigured eyes. As long as we see only with physical eyes, we will always be looking for love. We will always be bored with life, bereft of joy, bound by guilt, and in fear of death. So will we continue to live as if what we see is all we get? Or will we let our seeing bring us face to face with the mystery, the wonder, the grace of God? Transfigured eyes do not deny or ignore the circumstances of our world. They show us rather that in the midst of, and sometimes despite those terrible circumstances, those acts of rage and fear, anger and hopelessness, mistrust and suspicion that so plague our moments, Despite those circumstances, there is nothing but God. There is only God. There is nothing but life. There is only life. There is nothing but love, only love. There is nothing but light. There is only light. This deeper scene, this transfigured vision is what allows us to face, to endure, to respond to the circumstances of our life and world. It's why we can get up and not be afraid in the morning. It is the source of our thanksgiving. This transfigured vision sustained the disciples through Jesus' crucifixion into his resurrection. Perhaps this is why the church asks us every year to tell the transfiguration story on the last Sunday after Epiphany. It is the beginning to our Lenten preparation. It functions as the hinge between the season of Epiphany, that season of wonder and promise, and the season of Lent, that journey down into the valley and our way out again. Throughout the season of Epiphany, God has turned his face toward humanity and Lent is the season when we learn anew to turn our face to God, that we might look up and see Jesus himself, God's beloved, radiant with the light of heaven, dazzling in purity, shining in hope and joy. The Lenten season is our time to stand in the wonder of Jesus' dazzling light and to see fully the grace and the glory of God. Oh, let the journey of resurrection begin as we look face to face into the eyes of our loving Lord, Jesus Christ, the Beloved.